It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Monday of NCAA Tournament Week. Selection Sunday has uh, arrived and gone. And we now know where the Zags will be playing, who they're playing, and, and kind of a look at their bracket. We'll do all that uh, coming up. But uh, first, uh, we usually do an overview to start it, where the Zags are in the net and the bracket projections. We don't have to do that anymore. We know where they're at. I think they're in the top 17, maybe 17th in the net. They are a fifth seed in the uh, Midwest region playing McNeese State in Salt Lake City. Uh, probably two lines above where I had them uh, or where I saw most of the brackets had them uh, going into Selection Sunday. So they got, a, in my mind, a pretty good seed, uh, a great location other than Spokane. Couldn't get any closer. Uh, Foxy, what'd you do? Uh, what'd you think when that uh, five line came up and Gonzaga's name appeared? Yeah, I was admittedly a little surprised, although I, I thought in my mind, I thought they were firmly a six, even with the loss to St. Mary's. So, you know, I think sometimes the committee will move a team up or down one, um, depending on geography and, and previous matchups. So um, certainly nice when it bounces your way and you go up the rankings uh, or the seed line versus going the other way. Gonzaga's had a few of those over this run. So I think if we just look at it over the course of 25, 26 years, we're, it's still uh, a wash, right? But uh, I think they're certainly happy to be in Salt Lake. To your point, it's not difficult travel. Um, you'd expect to have some Gonzaga folks be able to travel to that game, fans that is. So I'd expect them to have a pretty solid contingency down there. And, um, you know, it, you're going to have to play difficult teams no matter where they put you in the tournament. And this is no different, but the travels and the, and the proximity to Spokane is certainly a nice benefit. Well, first, the important stuff. Uh, two words for you, Foxy. Red Iguana. What uh, What do you know about that place? What's your uh, review of it? You know, buddy, this is a good example where we should talk about these things before you bring them up on the podcast, because I, I, I'm presuming this is a, maybe a restaurant of some kind. This is a Mexican restaurant in Salt Lake okay, City. okay. That is a number one seed, overall number one seed, <laughs> all world, wow. all everything. Like number number one recruit in the country, just like that, that good. Yeah, that's what okay. we're talking. You have not so, eaten at the Red Iguana, I take it. So, so if I if we presume Gonzaga wins, and they're playing Thursday, right? Thursday, yeah. Saturday, you get there Wednesday, you're leaving Sunday. Over or under two and a half times, how many times are you going to be at the Red Iguana? Oh, first of all, I'm getting there Tuesday because pressers are Wednesday. Oh, God. Okay, three and a half. Three and a half. I, that is the move. I'm going to go under three and a half, and the only reason is because you usually have to wait. I'm guessing 40 to 45 minutes most of the time. In fact, about eight, ten years ago, three of us went there, and we uh, we were starving. We hadn't eaten, and the wait was 50 minutes, and we, we left and went somewhere else. Uh, that is a mistake that haunts me to this day, Foxy. That's just a, how one, one of those moments in your life when you just realize you miss an opportunity. Yeah, life changing. It was. Yeah. It was just a bad well, call. So I'm I, I'm rooting for you to, uh, you know, <laughs> hey, with, with the reach our podcast has, maybe the owners will hear this and all of a sudden you make you the Sharn Farnham of the 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 iguana place. You know where I would volunteer for that. I would volunteer for that. Let's pipe this baby into the Utah airwaves and yes, get that going. Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. All right. We got a ton to talk about. Salt Lake City is going to be a little bit of a reunion for the Zags. Uh, Dan Monson, uh, the best story of, of championship wow. week. Former Zag coach took uh, Long Beach State back to the tournament. Five days after the school said he's not coming back next year. He's uh, he's lining up against Tommy Lloyd's Arizona Wildcats in in uh, Salt Lake City. Dan uh, is responsible for bringing uh, Tommy on to Gonzaga staff, but he left for Minnesota 
before that all became official, told Mark Few, hey, you got this guy, you need to hire him. And Tommy was just hanging around, knocking on Fuey's door, and Fuey did hire him, and the rest is history. So you've got that angle. And uh, so we'll get to all that. Let's go back through uh, the WCC tournament. Uh, go into the tournament as the second seed, play San Francisco again. They had just played San Francisco at the Chase Center and kind of handled them in the uh, second half especially. I think it was 89-77. So they open up with San Francisco, uh, almost a duplication of, of what we've seen in the first two matchups, the one in Spokane yeah. and the one at the Chase. Tight throughout the first half, one-point game. All three of their games were one-pointers at halftime, and the Zags just took over in the second half. They, uh, I think they scored 51 points in that second half, virtually unstoppable. Graham E.K. did what uh, – or, or actually, that was uh, – uh, one of the quieter games for Graham E.K. They uh, really had guys draped all over him. We'll talk about Graham a little later in the show, but the Zags had plenty of weapons. Ben Gregg, four threes. Uh, Anton, I think, had 17 points. Uh, Nolan Hickman had a huge second half, 20 points, six assists. Nemhard put up a line that's pretty much what he's been doing for a few months, 16 points, 12 assists. Uh, just could not stop the Zags, even though they, they took away EK. Impressive win. To do that three times against a very good team, uh, that says something about the Zags and how hot they've been here in the last month or two. Yeah, I, yeah, I was looking at it this morning, just trying to get ready for, for this. And I think if you've gone into the game and told that the San Francisco staff, look, you're going you're gonna to score 77. You've been averaging 67 against the top two teams in the league. You're going to shoot 46% from the field. You've been shooting under 42. You're going to shoot better than 35 from three. You've been shooting sub 30. You're going to have 21 assists on 29 field goals made and only turn it over, over eight times. How do you think you're going to do? I think the staff would have thought, we're going to win this game. Yeah. And it just, it's amazing what's happened, uh, what happened over the last year for the Dons against Gonzaga. And, and I don't know if... Uh, you know, sometimes you just have a team's number, and it is what it is. And it just feels like Gonzaga has, you know, this last season had San Francisco's number in that second half. I mean, to your point, it's the same story every time. I mean, you could have written the, your game story, probably some portion of it, ahead of the game had you just presumed it would be the same thing as you saw the first two times. It's a, it's it's just a carbon copy. And um Look, for Gonzaga, all five starters in double digits. Uh, you know, you highlighted some of those guys. I thought Nemhard was exceptional. Hickman was was as good as he's been all year. Quite frankly, has been good down the stretch for Gonzaga. If both of those guys could play at that level together at the same time, it just reinforces the idea that Gonzaga's got to run in them. I thought that minutes for Stromer and Huff provided off the bench were really important and solid. 17 minutes between the two freshmen. Uh, nine points effective from the field, um, no turnovers. So they're in the game. They're not hurting you, you know, coughing up the ball, no bad fouls, that kind of thing. And that's really what, you know, that needs to be the baseline, I think, for them. If, if Gonzaga can get a game where one or the other or maybe both provide more offensive punch, that's going to be go a long way. But they don't need that to win. That's a luxury. What they need to win is what those guys did against San Francisco, which is be, just be solid. Um, you know, I, I, look – for the difference was the points off turnovers. Gonzaga's, uh, I think, plus six fast break points. Gonzaga's plus eight. Gonzaga had a 12, 12 free throw attempt advantage uh, in the game. And then San Francisco, four or 15 from the three point line in the second half, just could not buy threes at all. Um, just a really dominant performance, but quite frankly, kind of you know, in hindsight, not all that surprising given what we saw the first two times around. Yeah, Benny Gregg had four threes. I think they might have all been in the second half, uh, no. in a hurry in the second half. 11 boards, so another double-double for him. They they are a different team when he is going. And he doesn't have to score a bunch or rebound a bunch. But when he is very involved in making those energy plays, they just have a different aura about him. Uh, again, we've talked about this, another replay. Uh, Jonathan Mobo. The, the mm -hmm. fine forward for USF almost uh, repeated what he's done against the Zags all year. I think he had 10 points, nine boards, five assists. 
very good numbers, solid. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still think, uh, you know, they probably are hoping he would be a little more aggressive on the offensive end, have more of an impact that way. And, and uh, the Zags did a pretty good job slowing him down as well. Uh, I got to imagine the coaching staff there is just thinking this kid could score 20 he, very easily. He just has that ability. But uh, third game in a row, very, very similar yeah. to what we saw in Spokane and its Chase Center. Yeah. Well, look, it, I think it's to be fair to him, the jump he made this year versus where he was at last year was remarkable. Um, yeah. Look, you could put together a pretty compelling case. He's the most improved player in college basketball. I'm not saying he is, but. When you look at what you know where he was at last year to what his importance was to Gonzaga this year, being all conference, newcomer of the year, that kind of thing. A really remarkable step forward. And that's gonna be, I think I would imagine, the uh the narrative for him in San Francisco in the summer, um, is that you know, okay, we've we've now we've increased the floor here. Let's now try to increase the ceiling. And that is a hundred percent about being aggressive when he has the ball. Um and looking for his offense first, he's, you know, but, you know, I always, I've, I would rather have to pull a kid back and, and versus having to pull it, pull it out of him, but you can do that. You can pull it out of him. And I think, you know, watching him play, he's clearly a guy who wants to fit in within the system, wants to play with people, doesn't want to be the center of things and just take things over. And that's okay. But you got to pull that part of the part of it out of him because he's that good. I mean, he's a guy, he, he's an all, he's a WCC player of the year type of talent. Um, this is not just a really solid guy who's been all league two or three times. And you and I, you and I remember who he is, but the normal fan forgets about him after a couple of years. This is a guy who could win, you know, be a player of the year in the conference. So, you know, I, I think if you're San Francisco, I mean, every year is so difficult now for, for every team, including Gonzaga, you really don't know who's coming back, who's leaving all that stuff, but if they can bring him back, they've got a really nice piece and a good foundation. So, um, I think on balance for the Dons, a really a good year. You know, I'm sure there's disappointment that they missed some opportunities, but overall, <clears throat> they've clearly cemented themselves in my mind as the third best team, or probably the the yeah the third best team program right now in, in the conference. And and I think that's something they can they can tip their hat on and. Uh, it, it, look, it's it's hard for San Francisco. It's hard for anybody to beat Gonzaga when they have 23 assists on 31 field goals made and only three turnovers. So yeah. there's no, no this, shame in losing. Yeah, I, no, and I was going to say you're you're dead right. Uh, the kid is a great player. He is going to be a real problem <laughs> if he stays yeah. out there or wherever. He, if he goes somewhere, he is just that good. And the Don's now playing in the NIT. So uh, a postseason for them as well. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. But uh, let's go back through Gonzaga St. Mary's round three in Vegas for the title. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, hype for this game. They'd split in the regular season. The Zags uh, won by 13, I believe, in Moraga in the last regular season game. They came in with a lot of momentum, the winning streak. Uh, I think there was a sense that, yes, St. Mary's won the regular season by a game over Gonzaga, but the Zags were playing, uh, you know, at a high level, had just beaten the Gales and and were kind of primed to maybe do it again in Vegas, and it did not happen. The, the St. Mary's trademarks were all on display. They controlled the pace. They dominated the glass, which really was the tipping point in that game. Uh, they do what they do on offense. They're very resourceful. They find a way to score enough. And they held Gonzaga to season low, 60 points. The previous low, 62 against St. Mary's in Spokane. Uh, and, and what I give them credit for most of, most of all is not only uh, how they did it. And we've talked about Josh Jefferson not being around, so a uh, big loss in their lineup. But very much like the game in Spokane, the Zags were ahead. I think it was 52-51. And hostile environment, you know, probably 85% of the crowd was, was Gonzaga. They'd made a comeback in the second half. They went ahead, got the momentum, and the Gales didn't blink. They just got right back on it. I think they scored seven in a row, took the lead, and, and, and did not uh, – did not really give Gonzaga much of a chance down the stretch. They held that lead and extended it. 
pretty impressive to do that twice against Gonzaga, against all the circumstances they faced, and and uh, obviously a deserved championship for the Gales. Yeah, look, I, I just I think sometimes you you have to acknowledge what it is you see over the course of three games and, and to a, to another degree, you know, over the course of a conference season and quite frankly, St. Mary's proved it to be the better team of the two. Um, and to your point, that's, that's a difficult environment. It's not a true road game, but it sure probably feels that way for the Gales. And um, look, you're tied 52, 52 is seven, 18 remaining down the stretch of that game. St. Mary's is 15, has 15 points. It's at six. They just executed, I think at a higher level, um, you know, it was a great college game, you know, watching it from my, uh, you know, my, uh, my spot at the house. That's throughout the game. I just kept thinking to myself, what a great game, you know, both teams, um, super competitive, chippy, but you know, one of the impressions I had, Jim, and I don't know if you felt this way at all or not, but it just felt like it meant a little bit more to the Gales, um, particularly down, down the stretch, um, you know, I, I may be off base with that, but that was my impression watching it from home. It just felt like they were more desperate for the win. Um, but, you know, St. Mary's in the second half, you know, to your point, it's, it's if not, you know, it's damn near a tight game there at halftime, but St. Mary's in the second half shoots 50% from the field, three of seven for the three point line, gets to the line 20 times um, yeah. on the game, plus 12, or rather, plus eight on the game. Plus 12 in the second half. They were plus 17 on the glass. They had seven more offensive rebounds, which, you know, resulted in 11 second chance points. Um, you know, even in the paint, I thought Saxon was tremendous. You know, 19 points, 15 rebounds, six of those being offensive with a couple assists, a couple steals. Um, you know, Mahaney, Marshallonis were just, you know, they played 40 minutes just like Hickman and, and them hard and, um, I thought the combination of those two were just better uh, with Hickman's struggles from the field. Um, you know, I thought that was interesting to, when you watch a St. Mary's Gonzaga game, as you know, that you know, this is so much of it comes down to Bennett and few and how they adjust. And if you remember at St. Mary's Gonzaga had a lot of success blitzing the pick and roll, particularly with Greg yeah. and it, it caused problems for St. Mary's. Well, Gonzaga tried doing that there late, you know, call it that 10 minute mark to maybe the seven, eight, six minute, minute mark. And, and St. Mary's would dump it all, you know, kick it out to Saxon because he's the guy sending the ball screen. Um, and I think that was a change too. It wasn't Forbes coming up as much. And he, he made plays. You know, Huff got a good block on him once, but he came down, had dumped it off to Mace, to Forbes, I think once if not twice, scored. And Gonzaga went away from that entirely. And just went to switching yeah. the ball screen, and you know Gonzaga just put Ek in that, or St. Mary's rather put Ek in that time and time again, and Ek just couldn't hold up. And that's not a criticism of Graham. That's a difficult spot to be in with Marshallonis and Mahaney is to say you're one on one, and that's not Graham's skill set. And I thought, I mean, you know, I didn't go back and and watch the game again and, and kind of track it. But I, I'm confident St. Mary scored on six to seven of those one-on-one -on -one situations, um, and kept so getting I, I, to the line. Yeah, yeah, and I, so I, that was just an interesting wrinkle in the game: how Gonzaga's ball, uh, ball screen coverage was, and then they abandoned that idea um, to go with you know just switching everything. And I, you know, it's uh, easy to say after the game's over that that's probably a mistake, but I think that that didn't help them down the stretch. But a great game. You know, up and down, guys had great performances. I thought Dukas was going to be really important. I think I said that last week. Watch him. He only had six points. You know, rebounded it well. Um, but, you, you know, I didn't have Mason Forbes in my uh, on my bingo card that he was going to have, you know, played 35 minutes and, you know, eight points, five rebounds, four of those offensive. They were enormous second-chance opportunities. So, um, great college game and, and just – you know, at that, at that, but when you, when you look at it all on balance, I just think you saw that St. Mary's has a little bit more, had a little bit more this year uh, than Gonzaga in league play. Yeah, no question. And you're right about the ball screen coverage and you're right about Forbes. He, he was very good that, that game. And he is athletic, bouncy, can, can guard a little bit, really can get on the glass 
uh, if he can give them that in the tournament, they have a chance to go a ways. And it's ironic how the tournament seeding unplayed for the NCAAs, they're a five seed coming to Spokane and Gonzaga is a five seed going to, <laughs> to uh, yeah. Salt Lake City. I'm wondering if the Zags had won, if that gets flipped. And they're, and they're coming to Spokane. We'll never know. But uh, congratulations to the Gales. I expect them to, to win a game or two. Maybe maybe make a run here. I think they're that good. Uh, but we're more worried about what Gonzaga does in the tournament. And they have a first-round matchup, McNeese State. I believe it's the Southland Conference, regular season champ, tournament champ, 30-3. and three. Uh, mm-hmm. uh Quite a turnaround under Will Wade, the former LSU coach, in his first year, which he promised. I've seen the video that they were going to make this huge turnaround and it wouldn't take them long. And they did it. And so 30 wins. I think UConn and maybe James Madison are the only other teams with 30 wins going into the NCAA tournament. All three losses by single digits, two, three, and nine points. Uh, Look, I don't. You know, know a lot of the teams in the Southland, but uh, they scored it a ton. I think they averaged about 80 a game. They gave up 60-ish a game. Uh, they shoot the three, around 39%. They shoot the two, and, you know, they're they're almost 50% on the year. And one thing that yeah. really stood out to me, they play a lot of guards. Uh, best one is, Shah- I think it's Shahada Wells, who played at TCU last year against the Zags in the tournament, just played five minutes and the Zags win in the second round, but he's around 17.8, shoots it well, playmaker, third in the country in steals. This team averages 10 steals a game. This That is very high, and assist to turnover ratio, 1.54. That's in the top 25 nationally. Uh, if you don't know the name, don't know anything about him, uh, be wary here. This is a 12 seed. That 5 12 seed is always interesting. But this team has some personnel. I don't think they have a ton of bigs, but a lot of guards that can do some things. Uh, I'm not sure this is the best draw this <laughs> Zags could have had in a 5 12. Wow. I appreciate you looking over my shoulder and stealing all my stats there, Jim. So thank you for that. Um... <laughs> Uh, you you hit it right on the head, man. This is a really good team, and, and certainly uh, the Southland Conference is not the WCC. It's not a, a, a it's a notch below the the West Coast Conference. But that who cares? They won thirty games this year, and the mistake you make is thinking, well, they play in a lower conference, um, so they haven't seen anybody quite like Gonzaga. Doesn't matter. Um, they know who they are. They play super hard. Um, they will guard you to your point. They're excellent defensively, ranked number three in the country, holding teams to 38% or under 39% from the field. Um, they get to the line, shoot about 22 a game. They put a lot of pressure on you uh, with the drill penetration, but they can shoot it at a really high clip to your point. So they're good on both sides of the ball. I don't care who they play. They're, they're going to come in with zero pressure. Um, and you know, they, they're just going to have a lot of confidence. They have nothing to lose, you know, and that's always the, that's the flip side of being an established program like Gonzaga and, and turning things on down the stretch is, you know, despite how difficult this year was and what an accomplishment I, I would imagine it feels to be a five seed after given where you were at, call it February 1st, and all of a sudden, you know, no, no one, you know, people think you're going to win that game. And when in that in Salt Lake city and in that gym, it, if it gets tight, Europe, it's a road game. And you and I have been in those arenas when all of a sudden the upper seed is struggling to a lower seed, how everybody gets into the, in, into that moment and it can get really, really difficult and tight for the for the higher seed. So, um, you, you know, you're right in that um, Wells is, is a difficult matchup. I mean, he's he shoots 40% from the three-point line. At six foot, he still shoots over 50% attack in the rim, and he gets to the free throw line five times a game. So he doesn't have great size, but he's really quick, has a lot of uh, juice to his game, and he's a good rebounder, four and a half rebounds, you know, takes care of the ball, five assists a game. Um, it's going to be interesting. I, you know, you talked about the lack of depth up front. They don't, they don't play a lot of guys. 
um, against VCU uh, in their last game. They scored 76 points, shot it really well, but only played um, basically six guys. All five of their starters played over 30 minutes. So a lot like Gonzaga, they don't have a lot coming off the bench. And, you know, from the from a – you know, Gonzaga's advantage is going to be their front line. And the the matchup that I'll be – the two matchups I'll be most interested in is uh, uh, and, and Tovian Cullum, transfer from Cal State Bakersfield, 6'9". And you would think, well, Graham, Graham E.K. is going to guard him, but he shoots over 40% from three um, okay. versus Christian Shoemate, 6'6", kind of more of a combo forward. Um, he's a very good defender, 47 blocks, 31 steals in 33 games, only shoots at about 24% from three. So I'll be interested to see where Gonzaga puts EK um, because this is a difficult game for a five. They will, they will spread you out. They have shooters. They put it on the floor. They play fast. So where do you put Graham? You know, who do you put him on defensively? And it's going to be an interesting um, kind of, Styles make you know, styles make fights, and Gonzaga is going to be so much bigger than McNeese, um, given how they start with Greg. You know how does that hold up against the smaller team and McNeese, who's got a lot more quickness and will put it on the bounce and try to speed things up? And Gonzaga impose their physicality, their size, strength, and and dominate the glass, limit McNeese to one shot, yeah. and then on the on the other side of the floor, they've got to make McNeese have to defend EK. This has to be an EK game. He, he can't get in foul trouble. He's got to we, – we'll, we can talk more about Graham here after we we, we kind of get through the first weekend here of, of the tournament. But they need a big game from Graham. And then the other thing I would say before we might move on is this is a game for Dusty Stromer. I think he's been playing better. I've told you for a while now that I really believe the freshmen will be – will take them as far as they go. This is a game where Dusty's not going to I, – I would expect to see him play 20, 22, 25 minutes because of just the matchup. So can Gonzaga keep Graham, Greg, and Watson in for stretches but then go you know, more to that perimeter lineup and have more quickness defensively but still have that you know, a dominant interior presence with EK or Watson or Huff? I'll just be really interested. Can Gonzaga get away with playing their bigs uh, their, their big lineup as long as they did. I mean, as an example, against St. Mary's, Watson plays 40, Greg plays 38, and, it, and EK plays 20, but he had the foul trouble, so Huff played the other 10. So your bigs all played 30 minutes if you combine Huff and EK together. I don't know if you can do that against McNeese, yeah. Jim. I'll be interested to see. No, that's the give and take of, that, of the uh, big three. Uh, playing three bigs together, you, you 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 know you can maybe exploit it on the on the offensive end to some degree. At the defensive end, it it can be difficult to match up against a six four kid that can, you know, is lightning quick, can go to the rim, is going to get a ball screen, work off the ball screen. Uh, that's going to be the crux of the issue is is how that goes down. But I will say one thing: the way St. Mary's handled Gonzaga on the glass. It's all those guys we're talking about yesterday during the media availability. And and I think Ben Gregg mentioned after the game and then on Sunday with the three bigs, there's no way we should be getting beat on the glass like that. So I would expect they will get after it on the glass. And maybe that's one of the one of the you know advantages GU would have offensive glass. Uh, if they can work that uh, get back to to taking care of the window uh, with the three bigs uh, that may soften whatever harm happens at the other end of the floor. We'll see. That's going to be a fascinating matchup. Uh, let's look, look at that, that Midwest region kind of in, as a whole, if the Zags win, they would play uh, number four, Kansas or number 13, Samford. Samford's got offensive numbers very much like McNeese state. Mm -hmm. Shoot it great. They Shoot do. it good from three. Kansas. This kind of comes in uh, uh, limping, uh, so to speak. They uh, they did not dominate the the Big Twelve like they do every year. They they were uh, I don't know how many losses they finished with, but uh, it, it was a few places down in the standings, which is not normal for the Jayhawks. Hunter Dickinson, I think, has a shoulder thing going on. Kevin McCuller is one of the best two way players in the country. Uh, he's not fully healthy either. I think he's back, but but maybe not fully healthy. 
a little bit vulnerable in in that matchup with Samford. Uh, you've got the one seed in the region, Purdue. The Zags have seen them twice the last two years. That did not go well either time. <laughs> Zach Eady going to be the player of the year again. Uh, at least he was on my ballot. I, I sent in my wooden award this morning, and he's number one on my ballot again. Um, wait, 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 Hold on, Jim, just so I, you, you have a ballot for that? Yeah. Yeah, That's nice. for years. Yeah. And the league doesn't yeah. allow uh, the media, the, the league doesn't allow the media to vote for all conference stuff. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, I jumped in sorry, right sorry. there, but we got too sorry. much to cover. I know. Go, 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 go. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to derail us. I'm going to derail us. Go, go. I do hear what you're saying. Go, 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 go. I do hear what you're saying. <laughs> um, but uh, Purdue's the one. Uh, yeah, no, excuse me. Tennessee, the two? Am I right? I yeah, think Tennessee's, Tennessee's the, the two. two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the bottom Creighton, of the there. Yep. Creighton is the three, and that's the team. That team's dangerous. That team can score it. They've been there. They got to the Elite Eight last year and probably should have moved on. Had San Diego State on the run and uh, they called a late foul on Ryan Nemhard, who's now a zag that uh, a lot of folks didn't agree with. Uh, that team has been battle tested. If I've got a dark horse, that's the that's the one I think can get through the entire region. I think they're that good. Uh, but what do you make if the Zags advance of a Kansas matchup and the region as a whole? How, how do you, uh, is it stacked? Is it uh, open for the taking? What do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. Kansas is just, to your point, limping into the tournament. They, um, I mean, effectively, I think, punted on the Big 12 tournament just to get their guys the ability, some time to rest. Um, but they've got Kansas top-end college talent, uh, particularly with uh, McCullough, as you mentioned, who's a pro. You know, Dickinson's, you know, I'm not sure he's an NBA player, but super, certainly a very, very high-level college basketball player you know I believe he's been an all-american in the past has just been very productive throughout the course of his career but they basically played five guys that has been a challenge for Kansas all year they've got two players coming off the bench Timberlake and Jackson who average double digit minutes that's it and both those guys are pretty limited that's been a challenge for Kansas all year and I think that's led you know we talked about it for Gonzaga Gonzaga's been able, been able to avoid that um, in that they haven't had it, guys kind of break down here down the stretch physically, but Kansas, I, I think it, you know playing in that Big Twelve, playing in the Big Twelve is different than WCC certainly, and I think it just caught up with them not having that depth. So I, I'm not really sure what Kansas team you're going to see. You're going to see the, a healthy Kansas team that was looking like a legitimate number one team in the country uh, in December and November. Or are we going to see a team that's still pretty banged up and uh, a little bit out of rhythm? So we'll see. Sanford to your point earlier, is a super interesting team. They played 12 guys. Mm -hmm. Seriously, 12 guys. The, the Ryan uh, Ryland Jones leads the team with 26 minutes per game. I'm going to look at it real quick if I can find them. What was he, have, fifth on the Zags at that race? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten guys average in double digits. And a couple others that are played in every game under single digits. So they play a ton of guys. They score at almost 87 a game. Really shoot the ball well. Um, almost 40%. Make 10 a game. Shoot 25. They turn teams over. Average you know, opponents nearly 17 turnovers a game. They're just okay defensively, though. They don't rebound it well. So if, if they can get out and run and use their depth to wear you out, make shots, they're really difficult out. So I'll be interested. I mean, that's just an interesting matchup. Uh, not really understanding where Kansas is at, but if Kansas is healthy, you'd expect them to win that game, but they don't have the depth. So this is why we love the tournament. Um, I, I don't think the region's all that difficult. The one thing I would say, if you had asked me before Sunday, what's the number one seed you'd want to avoid? I would have said Purdue. Mm -hmm. I don't want to play Zach Eady again. That's just difficult. Um, We've seen and, that movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it's <laughs> we talked about the San Francisco deal being, uh, you know, the third time being the same as the first two. I don't know. I have any reason to believe that Zach Eady is not going to have a fun night against the Zags. He just it, look, he's that difficult to match up with. Um, and I, I think Carolina, um, you know, even you know Connecticut, I think is the best overall team. 
But, you know, the way that they play, I think, fits better with Gonzaga's, you know, preferred way of playing. They don't have a guy like Edie that's just going to, I don't know. It, I just, I don't like that matchup for Gonzaga. But on balance, you know, I think it's wide open. Um, I uh, Oddly enough, Jim, I, I think McNeese is a harder matchup for Gonzaga than either Kansas or, Sam, or uh, Sanford. Mm. So I think if they can win on Thursday, I'd expect them to win on, on Saturday. Well, let's cover a couple of things uh, as we wind down here. Graham E.K., we mentioned this. I think he had 10 points in each of the last two games. He'd yeah. been coming in on that enormous hot streak, seven straight over 20. Uh, high, high efficiency from the field. That didn't happen these last two games. I think he was 9 of 23, if my math is right, which it usually isn't. Uh, San Francisco, they did it differently. San Francisco... Uh, basically, you know, had guys hanging off each of his arms and somebody behind him. And <laughs> I mean, he drew attention. It was like he was giving out hundred dollar bills. They were all over him and uh, didn't give him much room to breathe. Uh, St. Mary's was a little more straight up uh, defensively with, with Saxon. Um, sometimes brought help, sometimes just kind of dug and, and recovered, whatever. Uh, not they, they were able to do it a lot of times with Saxon, uh, 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 man to man. Uh, do you think any, any of the, I'm sure all these teams are going to watch those two games, seeing Graham's numbers for the season and how impactful he was and seeing, Oh, 10 points, these last two, what did those guys do? Uh, do you think there's a blueprint out there or is that just, uh, two teams that said he's not going to be the guy who takes us apart? Well, that's a good question because, you know, to your point, uh, I mean, that's it, that's it, San Francisco game, that second half was such a such a, a blowout. You know, I, I kind of didn't really chalk much up to his, his numbers. I mean, 4 of 11, not as, not as efficient as he has been, but, yeah. you know, you're in control of that game. Um, look, Saxon was defensive player of the year. We could debate whether or not he, he should have had that, but he is still a very, very good defender. And he is his ability just to wall up Graham and not give a lot of ground. Then he forced Graham to shoot over uh, his body a lot. And Graham's had success against Saxon. So, you know, it's one game. Um, but most teams don't have a guy like Saxon. McNeese yeah. certainly doesn't. You know, Kansas would with Dickinson. But I, I think that's an okay matchup for Graham, even though he's given up maybe th two, three, four inches, just because he has the strength and, and I think the touch to play with a guy like that. Um, I'm less concerned about the offense. Look, it's difficult to get a rhythm when you're you're battling the fouls that he was ba battling. Um, St. Mary's is a unique animal anyway. You're, you're not going to likely play a team like that. I don't know if there's another team like St. Mary's. Maybe Virginia, that you know, maybe WSU to some degree that yeah. kind of play that way defensively. So I don't want to put too much stock on it. The, 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 to me, the red flag is not his production. To me, to me, the red flag is how he handled the foul trouble. And, you know, we're, we're now at the point where, you know, there's no film session after the next loss where we talk about, hey, you've got to do this or you've got to react better. If you can't get it together in these games, we go home. That's the message. He gets so caught up with the officiating. I mean, you can just see he's constantly talking to the officials. He's complaining about all these calls. Two of those fouls in the second half against St. Mary's, were dumb. Look, I mean, they're just careless. Like they're 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 they are vows I'd expect to see Braden Huff make. Mm. He's a freshman. Graham has to appreciate how important he is to what Gonzaga does. Even if he's not scoring in the way he wants to, him being on the floor has he he's such a he he he, he has so much gravity to himself when he's out there that teams have to to guard Gonzaga differently when he's in the game, even if he's not effective. They don't have to do any of that if he's on the bench. And so I, I, that to me was the, kind of the red flag, Jim, was just you're in the tournament, there's going to be a game, particularly if you make a run. It might be Thursday when you're playing an undersized McNeese State team where you get a crew, an officiating crew, that for whatever reason doesn't like how physical you are. You might get a cheap call in the first half, you know, in the first three minutes, four minutes. How do you react to that? And I just think he lets that stuff snowball. He's had foul trouble issues throughout the course of the year. He's been much better lately. 
but I thought he reverted back to what he looked like with, when it came to those those whistles in the non-conference a little bit, where it, it just it's, it becomes too big a deal for him. So I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, Ryan Emard is the most important player because he kind of keeps the you know the, the the wheels on the track. Uh, Graham E.K. is their best player, and he has to be able to navigate fouls. And, he, and it's, you know, you're going to have some bad calls, but you can't make bad plays that lead to those types of types of calls. And I thought he did that in the second half against St. Mary's. Maybe you saw it differently, but that's what I saw. No, foul trouble been kind of a source of frustration for him all throughout the year. All right, Foxy, that's going to do it. I guess uh, I'll ask you real quick, who's your, what, are we talking next Monday about two Zag wins, one oh, Zag I'm, loss, or one and one week? What's your... What do you, you got? Three options. What do you think? I'm going, think I'm going two I, and zero. Oh. I think they're going to the yeah, Sweet I agree. Sixteen. I agree. I agree. Okay. This this team has has um, they have rebounded well all year from adversity and from losses. Yeah. Um, so I, I expect that they'll they'll have a, a good week of practice, get get right, and I, they'll be ready to play. And this team certainly believes they have a chip on their shoulder. Um, so I think they went out too. Okay. Well, that's going to do it for the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. We're here every Monday. We'll post this in a couple hours. I uh, will see you soon, Radaguana, and uh, enjoy <laughs> enjoy the best uh, three weeks of the college basketball season and really the sports calendar, the NCAA tournament. There's nothing like it. And, uh, and we're uh, looking forward to watching and see how it all unfolds for the Zags. Back next Monday. Tune in then. We'll see you next Monday.